started with roll call, please. Commissioner Abraham? Present. Commissioner McElroy? Present. Commissioner Watkins? Present. Commissioner Wilson? Mayor Harless? Present. And Commissioner Watkins, would you lead us in the invocation tonight? Please stand. Shall we pray? Father God, as we come to you in prayer, we just thank you for this opportunity to petition you that you do care about us, you know us, you know you've got all the hairs on our head numbered, you've uh, saved us through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your salvation that you bestowed upon us. We didn't deserve it, but we thank you that you forgive us when we fail you and we love you and thank you for everyone here that's interested in the business of Paducah to try to make it a better place to live. That's what we're all here for and just pray you give us wisdom and guidance to make the right decisions. Again, forgive us where we fail you. We fail you. We love you, and just thank you for all your many blessings and above all your salvation through your Son. We give thanks for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please stay standing and join us in the pledge. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to its republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. You may be seated. City Manager, are there any additions or deletions tonight? No, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder before I call up our first presentation, if you're here for a public comment, there are comment cards um, over on that little table if you want to fill one out. And we will get to those at the end of the meeting tonight. Um, but we do have very, very special guests that are going to make some very important announcements tonight. Uh, first up, we have Gray Tomlin. Um, Graham, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and tell how great you are and all the wonderful <laughs> things you do. Um, and then also we have Judge Clymer here because he also gets to accept a very exciting announcement tonight, as does the city. So, Well, Mayor Harless, uh, uh, City Council, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, be with you this evening. Uh, I am the Commissioner of Rural Municipal Aid with the Transportation Cabinet. And uh, we do have some announcements to make tonight. So, But I want to start off by saying when Governor Bevan first appointed me as Commissioner of Rural Municipal Aid, uh, he made it my mission and my office's mission to uh, work with local officials across the Commonwealth to address infrastructure needs. And uh, he told me at the same time not to play politics. And he's told of a time traveling in 2015 uh, that uh, he's driving down a highway in eastern Kentucky and he sees orange barrels up ahead. And he slows down, he looks inside this big hole and there's two orange barrels sitting inside this hole from where the hole had actually grown larger from when the barrels were first set out. So he asked some of the locals, why is there a huge hole in the highway? And the response he was given was, well, our county's not the right political persuasion. And uh, governor said, at the end of the day, blacktop is black, it's not red or blue. We don't have Democratic or Republican roads, we have Kentucky roads for Kentucky people. And he's made it very clear uh, that it should never matter what political letter is beside your county's name or your town's name or your name or who you support, who your buddy is, or, or anything like that. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is that we're Kentuckians. And, uh, and, and so uh, we've had uh, uh, you know, challenges, financial challenges at the state level. I know municipalities across the Commonwealth have uh, financial challenges as well, uh, some more so than others. Uh, but just in the transportation cabinet alone, we, we are $6 billion short of what we need just to fix bridges. And uh, so we have significant challenges, transportation cabinet, but that's why it's so important. It's even more important that we work with local officials because who knows better than you uh, what your community needs. You travel these streets, drive these roads, cross these bridges every day, and uh, that's why it's so important. I, I know when I first met you, Mayor, and the city manager, Jim, uh, you know, my family and I, we were traveling, coming through. I was in uh, shorts and a T-shirt. I believe my son was in his cowboy boots and cowboy hat. And we came in, we met with you about infrastructure needs in the community. Uh, so with that said, discretionary funding is a little bit different than your municipal road aid. So municipal road aid is, is based on a formula, basically population. But discretionary fund is, is a fund allocated by the legislature that allows the governor the flexibility to disseminate projects throughout the Commonwealth. And it's really never been used for towns. It just hasn't. And making announcements is, is the best part of my job. Uh, but really, you know, don't get too excited because this is your tax dollars coming back to you. Right. It's kind of like getting excited about a tax refund check. Right. You know, <laughs> it's your money, but, you know, it's, it, it was always your money, right? right. Uh, so that's something that we've really focused on is uh, small towns, rural communities, uh, uh, municipalities that, that have needs like we all do. So with that said, I do want to um, 
announce some discretionary approval. For uh, first, we'll do for McCracken County uh, for a project that was submitted, uh, Milton Drive, and uh, this was the number one priority uh, for the judge. And it's a reconstruction of the intersection of Milton Drive at Star Hill Road and Iowa Street and the intersection of Milton Drive at Illinois Street. And it was a big safety issue because uh, there's a school nearby. It's heav heavily traveled by buses. And so uh, Governor Bevan has approved this project, this reconstruction, in the amount of $497,150. Wow. And Congratulations, Judge. <laughs> You know, and, and safety is is a top priority, and, um, and you know you can't put a price on on the safety of our kids, especially. And infrastructure will, will never be a partisan issue; it just won't, uh, regardless. Um, I don't know if you have a comment to make before I talk about Paducah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate the department's help on this. It's a, it's a strong example of the the city, the county, the the state all working. Uh, hand in hand and, and that's what we want to do and of course as you say it's a it's a safety project and so uh, and in this particular instance of course this was uh, initiated last year by the prior uh, McCracken County Fiscal Court Judge Leeper and uh, and uh, the fiscal court members so what happens they applied you did the work, got it done. Governor Bevan came through with it, and I get to stand up and, and, and you know, praise for it. So, so it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. But uh, thank you very much. Uh -huh. And if you pass on to the governor, uh, thanks. Sure. Thank you. And uh, Mayor, if you want to discuss the project that, that we had talked about uh, during my visit, just kind of give uh, the audience just a, an overview of what you applied for and why, uh, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Jim's actually going to do that for us. Okay. He led the efforts in filling out the application. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we basically looked at trying to do a, a local road that kind of connects the, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, from the high school where they're putting in the... Uh, uh, innovation, hub. The innovation hub all the way down to brick stadium working on the sidewalks asphalt resurfacing reconstruction reconstruction re and then uh, basically making it accessible all the way there through the uh, uh, housing authority projects as well bringing those people uh, bringing people so they can walk from the neighborhood all the way up to the high school and also having uh, good access to the uh, commercial corridor there so we're really excited about it sir sure. and, and the total i believe the total estimate of the project you had was seven hundred forty three thousand. Right. and you're going to put some public uh, funds into that mm -hmm. uh, so the request was six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and uh, Governor Bevan has approved that request for six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow, yes. big deal! <laughs> you know, this is this is a reimbursable uh, program, but if it, if it present if it uh, presents any financial challenges at all, I'm not sure what that might be for the city. Mm -hmm. You know, we can always work with you to maybe forward that money up front um, and then just kind of send in those invoices afterwards. But, you know, again, don't begin any work until there's a finalized contract. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I do want to say at the, at the end of the day, no matter what level of public service uh, you're at, whether it's the state, county, municipal level, we're all part of the same team. Mm -hmm. And none of us in this room are going to agree with everything or, every, you know, what any of us think 100% of the time. But, you know, to be able to work together uh, Democrat, Republican, Independent, it doesn't matter. Uh, the only way we can move our communities forward and the state forward is to work together. And uh, I, you know, I appreciate the working relationship that we have mm -hmm. uh, with you and, uh, and with the judge. And, uh, and we're going to continue working with you. This isn't the, the end, it's only the beginning. Um, and, and so like I said, you can still work with us on different funding projects. And we'll do the best we can with uh, with the funding that we do have. So I definitely appreciate your hospitality. Let me come and be with you today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I feel like we've just been on a game show or something. <laughs> um, because that also just let, I mean, <clears throat> let's remember you came to my office uh, during Fancy Farm, mm -hmm. which was only l what less than two months away or uh, uh, in the past. And we got this money this quickly. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, Commissioner Watkins can attest um, <coughs> as a former legislator. So thank you so much for working hard. I did want to make sure everyone knew that um, Kyle Pope was in the uh, um, the room, our Howie District Engineer, and also Mark Welch. Thank you both yes. for the work that you do for us. Uh, we've seen, I've seen a tremendous impact on the willingness to take action, to get work done, um, to not overthink it, <laughs> and to actually make sure that we're seeing progress in our community. So thank you. And please from the city send um, the governor our thanks as well. I sure will. And again, I want to thank all of you for stepping up to the plate to be public servants uh, because, you know, as soon as you take office, someone's mad. 
Uh, <laughs> someone's, you know, but you know, you, you have tough decisions to make at, at, at this level of government, and uh, and I just commend you for setting the plate to try to make your, this community the best version of itself. So thanks again. Appreciate thank your hospitality. Thank you so much. Thank have you. a good one. All right, next up, we are going to hear about our employee benefits plan from Michelle Smolin. All right, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. We are approaching a new benefit year, and so this is our regularly scheduled presentation from Peel and Holland. I will not steal their thunder, but um, you'll have some wonderful news coming your way, more wonderful news. And before I introduce um, the team, I do want to take a moment to think we have a great benefits team with HR, Finance, and Peel and Holland that do a great job of managing our plan. And then the entire organization for really buying into our wellness efforts, and you'll hear some pretty great news and some um, it's just some pretty great news for you see health costs climbing. So mm -hmm. with that, I will turn it over to DGA Story with Peel and Holland. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Hello. Nice. I don't have a check for $500,000, <laughs> so I'm going to just put that on okay. the board right away. Uh, I'm sorry. It's not that good a news. Uh, congratulations to everyone involved on that. Um, so yes, we have the information on the employee benefits plans uh, for this year. Um, it's been another great year for the city. Uh, in, in managing these health costs, which are not going down uh, nationwide or even regionally, but we've had a, a good track record of, of keeping those costs down, and that's been that's been a, a good benefit for the city and their employees. Uh, the agenda is to kind of walk through uh, briefly historical plan costs, uh, projected costs to, to finish out 2019. Uh, looking into 2020, the budget uh, funding for the budget and escrow, and then historical allocations and re recommendations for this year, as well as overall recommendations on other on other plan benefits. Um, so quickly on the historical cost overview, this is a is a busy slide, but I, the one thing I'll kind of point out is the the middle of the slide there is kind of net zero. Anything above that middle line is going to be costs uh, that are going out in relation to your health plan. So the dark blue bar is uh, city expense. So your you know administrative costs, costs for insurance, your claims costs, those kind of things. The orange bar there at the very top is the amount of expense that comes from uh, participants that are through the Joint Sewer Agency, which is part of the city's plan. Underneath that bar, there's a couple of pieces of that puzzle. Uh, the, light, the, the green uh, section is the stop loss reimbursements. You really see those on the left hand side, but we haven't had as much of those on the right, uh, which is a positive thing. The light blue is the JSA premium, so JSA is paying to be part of the city's plan as, as a reminder and how much they're paying in to, to get that uh, benefit. And then the uh, little bit darker shade of blue is the employee premiums that we've seen. The thing that I'll point out is that top bar, those costs have remained, when we, when we just look at that in a, as a net cost uh, to the plan, have remained fairly consistent over the years. Over on the left-hand side, we had a lot of reimbursements for stop loss. We had some, uh, unfortunately, had some sick folks on the plan that we had to get some reimbursements from stop loss, uh, some losses there, uh, but uh, the overall cost of the plan has remained fairly consistent. Uh, as you see that green bar trend down, what that means is that the folks that are exceeding the stop loss have decreased. We haven't had as many of those folks that have had these kind of catastrophic claims, which is a positive thing, because that means that Anthem, our reinsurer, isn't asking for more premium all the time because we're having we're costing them more and more money, which is a great thing as well. So this is just kind of a high level overview to see the consistency of the cost. Are there any cons uh, questions regarding this information? If not, I'll move on. So 2019 projection, this is gonna be a few different numbers we wanna walk through briefly. Uh, looking at this, we're looking at an expected claims projection as far as the cost uh, that the underwriter is expecting us to have uh, through the end of the year. Uh, that's that two, million four hundred and thirty three thousand dollar number uh, run out projection is uh, we project this in case we ever had to make the decision to move away from a self-insured plan we would need to pay for claims ex after the end of the year right so we'd have to pay for those claims as they continue to come in so we budget for that so in case of that contingency we uh, aren't going to be upside down in relation to that budget Admin and insurance is the, having the stop loss coverage. It's having Anthem process our claims and administer those claims. Uh, we're paying about half a million dollars for that, those services. The escrow, that's a, a, a budget number as far as what we're budgeting into that health. 
fund at 2.5 uh, or what the current amount is. Uh, the escrow spec that is budgeting 350,000, just expecting, okay, from a given year, we will have probably two claimants that are either at spec or close to that specific reimbursement level. And so we just budget that in so that we make sure that we're not eating into our escrow every time we have a high claimant because year to year to year, we're going to have somebody that's there or close to there. Uh, and we expect to have up to. So the escrow balance is at 2.1 when you factor that in. Escrow need, we have uh, set that in the past at $2 million. We want to keep a, a running total of about $2 million in that escrow account to be able to deal with the peaks and valleys. So with self-insurance, with health insurance, it's always the next year you could have two or three people that have catastrophic claims, and we want to make sure that we're budgeting for to be able to smooth that out when we have those bad years. Uh, and that is, that is what the city has determined in the past is a relatively uh, good number. Uh, so the funding need for this year it totals at three, just over three million. Uh, the premiums we're receiving from uh, the employees is is just over three million as well. So our net change or what we would need to be where we need the number we need to be at, uh, we're about forty thousand to the good of that number. So we don't need to change that number. We're actually negative to that change by one point three percent. I'll go to the next slide because this same number information is is listed. Uh, 2020 underwriting view, we look at a couple different columns. So when we're looking at the net change versus where we're at this year and the expected and maximum, when Anthem gives us information on the renewal, they're looking, the underwriter's looking at an expected number, how many claims we'll have, and they give us a maximum number that's about 25% over that expectation to say if we had a really bad year, we, we were budgeted for that. So we see in these numbers that they expect our claims to be very similar to this year, coming in at just about you know, just over 2.4 uh, million. Uh, the maximum number is over 3 million. If we have that really bad year, we're at that at $3 million number. The administrative and insurance cost slot comes down slightly, just some of the ways that Anthem has adjusted and we get some additional um, rebates from RX a piece of this as a part of that reduction as well. Uh, then we keep those same levels of escrow balances uh, and roll those forward. The funding need for the expected amount is 2.9 million. Uh, the funding need, if we had the maximum year, would be at 3.6. And if you go on down to the bottom, it shows that if we stay at expected, we're at a negative 2% change, so no need for change. If we had a maximum year, we'd be closer to an 18% change to be able to budget this year for a maximum number. So the, the benefit there is, is that we have that escrow to cover us. If we have that bad year, we don't have to make an 18% change in a given year in order to offset those costs. So before I move on, are there questions on this information? So to bring this out a little bit more, what we like to look is if we assume expected, if we assume maximum, or if there's a midpoint. So if there's a number somewhere in the middle, and when we're looking at this, again, there's that negative 2% number that we just talked about and that 18 or close to 18% number. A midpoint would be just under 8% that we would need to budget for if we thought that this next year was going to be somewhere between where the underwriters say we expect you to be and a maximum that could be. And this is assuming that we don't have um, that escrow to balance us out or we don't want to dip into that escrow or you know take any of that balance away. Okay. So... All that being said, over the course of the uh, last, since 2009, in the last 10 years, um, this, this shows the city allocations. So the, the allocation that the, the city is giving to employees uh, to take the health coverage, uh, the available wellness credits, so how much they can earn if they participate in the wellness program. And then we've listed the single insurance premium for an individual on the investor plan, which is a lower cost plan, how much that has been year over year over year. And then if they take advantage of the city allocation, they get the city allocation and they take the advantage of the wellness and they get the full wellness credit, how much they can actually get back into a health savings account to help cover their medical expenses. And that hasn't changed um, uh, since 2000 and, uh, well, the insurance premium for the individual hasn't changed since 2013. And our recommendation that it doesn't change again in 2020. Uh, with the amount of budget that we have, the escrow that we have to cover us in case there is a bad year, uh, our, our recommendation is we can keep the city allocation, the uh, wellness investment, uh, and the and premiums to individuals uh, flat for the upcoming 2020 year. 
And that is the eighth straight year of no changes for employee premiums, mm -hmm. which is um, unheard of. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with a lot of different clients and uh, that's not that's not a thing. I think, I mean, it's less than a 1% change and longer than that. And and unfortunately, that's just not the, the norm. RX costs are going up by probably 15 to 18% a year uh, for a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of uh, from the trend perspective and, and medical costs are going up six to 8% easily. So the ability to this team from the management and the uh, finance and HR to be able to manage through that, be proactive with that, um, keep that budgeted well, means that you, your employees haven't had to experience the peaks and valleys that the majority of, of employers have experienced. Mm -hmm. So kudos to everyone involved in that. So moving on from other programs, uh, this is really easy. Uh, dental is no change. There was no change to employee premiums or change to the plan on that. Vision was no change. The HRA was no change. Century Health, that's the disease management program. Edumetics was the previous name of it. It helps folks with diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, hypertension. Uh, they can engage with a nurse practitioner and get help with those conditions. Uh, there's no change to that program. The voluntary, that's like your Aflac products. There's no changes to those programs. And then wellness, the only thing with wellness is we are evaluating just based a lot on just far as administrative we're evaluating some administrative adjustments we're not recommending any changes as far as incentive structure to employees we're just trying to make sure that we uh, can do that if uh, effectively manage that and also make sure that we're getting the most engagement we can out of it I think what we're looking at this year is is trying to keep things as, as similar as possible but if there's anything of administrative change to help with that efficiency but we're also in talks to continue to evaluate how do we get more out of this program there's a huge level of investment uh, from the city into this program we want to make sure that employees are taking advantage of that we want to make sure that we're also focused in the right areas so the things that are making the biggest impact that we're investing our money there to encourage participation in those areas as well um, a few things that we're discussing in this are uh, changing some biometrics to more of a sliding scale uh, all, the only thing that means is just saying okay you're gonna get credit for the biometrics that you earn in the different areas versus a couple of different metrics like a gold and silver area um, we're still in you know, still in consideration but that's what we're evaluating uh, nicotine affidavit is automated just to make that to where it just you know it runs through the portal and doesn't have as much touches it's just easier to administer um, one thing that we uh, this that we're going to move forward on for this year is education sessions as of right now they're only um, crediting for about a, ha a half of a fitness event point we're going to move that to where that's a full fitness event point so it's just easier to track for one thing but also encourage those education sessions and that participation in those and then we're just going to again continue to review those opportunities and see where we can make the most impact uh, for the for the program, uh, you know, Peel and, at Peel and Holland, we're we're we helps also administer the wellness program. We're looking at no rate change for this year. It's on a 10-1 effective date, so no change to rates and things for for this program year. But as we evaluate that and see, you know, where we're going to drive engagement and how much administrative cost there is involved in that, we might have an administrative change from a fixed cost or a fee perspective in the future year. So just to let you know of that, uh, right now it's it's a three dollar and seventy four cent PE p.m. charge to administer that program so again it's just about getting the most out of that and make sure we're doing it efficiently so our recommendations um, are holding existing rates and allocations for city employees uh, mon continue to monitor the claims in escrow uh, the peel and holland team we meet with hr and finance on a monthly basis to stay proactive on what's going on with the health plan so continue that process uh, renewing insurer and service agreements uh, for, for this year, uh, continuing our wellness plan offerings, continuing Century Health and Disease Management, and then uh, continuing to focus on that well-being as a culture within the city. Y'all do a great program. You do an amazing amount of incentive structure to really engage folks. Uh, you have the best engagement of any client that we work with in regards to wellness initiatives. Let's make sure we're taking full advantage of that, and that's what we want to focus on in 2020. Any questions? I don't have any questions. Just want to uh, just comment that um, our team from HR to finance, incredible job of of making uh, all of us aware of wellness, fitness events coming up, uh, the care management. I thought that was a that was a great piece we added a few years ago. Yes, um, having guys having our employees checked out. Yes, uh, a lot of preventive maintenance type. 
yes. of uh, tools, and and the result of it is is what we're looking at. So uh, that's always a good thing. You drop a few pounds, you feel better, you work better. So uh, I'm all about that. So that's a great job, guys. Yes. Great job to everybody involved, and, and I will say that we see the re, the reports on that program in particular that show that, that we are getting success out of that. The po people that could be engaged are seeing better results. They're getting their numbers more in line. They're living healthier lives. That's, in effect, helping the overall cost of the plan as well. That's not the overall issue. That's not the reason we would engage in a program like that. We're here to help make people get healthier, but we're seeing it benefit and a return on investment as well, which is what you want to see as well also. So, Absolutely. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. you Appreciate you. All right, we're going to move into the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted by one motion and one vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member so requests. Does anyone have anything they'd like to remove tonight? No? Okay, I'm going to ask the city clerk to read the items recommended for approval, please. Approved minutes for the September 24th, 2019 Board of Commissioners meeting. Receive and file documents, personnel actions, a municipal order accepting the donation of real property located at 1321 South 8th Street from Isaiah and LaVerja Shaw to the City of Paducah and authorizing the mayor to execute the deconsideration certificate, a municipal order accepting grant funds through the U.S. Department of Justice for a 2019-2020 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Accountability Grant in the amount of $11,280 for the purchase of five handheld radios for the Paducah Police Department and authorizing the mayor to execute the grant agreement and all documents related to same. A municipal order authorizing the application for a 2019 Kentucky Litter Abatement Grant through the Kentucky Division of Waste Management for the Engineering Public Works Department Street Litter Abatement Program, accepting all award, awarded grant funds and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same. A municipal order approving and adopting the Comprehensive Health Insurance Benefit Plan premiums the vision insurance plan premiums and the dental plan premiums for calendar year 2020 for employees of the city of Paducah and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents related to same, the municipal order accepting the rates for stop loss insurance coverage and authorizing an agreement for administrative services with Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield for the group health insurance plan for the city of Paducah, Kentucky for the 2020 calendar year and authorizing the mayor to execute all documents relating to same. A municipal order establishing policy for use of spending credits toward the purchase of certain benefits such as health, dental, or vision pursuant to the city's group health insurance plan for the 2020 plan year. A municipal order authorizing payment to the Kentucky Economic Development Finance Authority for tax increment financing, TIF consultant services in an amount of $85,185 and authorizing the execution of all documents related to same. I make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Commissioner Abraham. Aye. Commissioner McRoy? Aye. Commissioner Watkins? Aye. Mayor Harless? Aye. Okay, Commissioner Watkins. I move that the Board of Commissioners introduce an ordinance entitled an ordinance amending Chapter 54, Article 2, Smoking in Public Places, Division 2, Enclosed Public Places, Places of Employment, and Certain Outdoor Places of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah, Kentucky. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance amends Section 5451 and 5452 of the Code of Ordinances to allow for the operation of cigar bars or cigar lounges in the City of Paducah. A cigar bar or cigar lounge must clearly state in its name and marketing that it is a, that it is a cigar bar or cigar lounge derive at least 10% of its gross revenue from the on-site sale of tobacco products, which products shall not include the sale of cigarettes, electronic smoking devices, or vaping liquids, and maintain an on-site walk-in humidor storing tobacco products for the intent of resale of said tobacco products. Smoking in a cigar bar or a cigar lounge shall be limited to cigars and pipe tobacco. Second. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. As uh, Commissioner Watkins attested to, this is a, uh, uh, a modification to the uh, current smoking ordinance that would allow the uh, a cigar bar or cigar lounge to operate in downtown Paducah. Uh, the manager's office believes this would be a nice uh, a business niche for the downtown area. We also believe it aligns with the uh, strategic plan, with that being to encourage and assist local business retention and expansion. Uh, so the, it is the recommendation of the manager's office to approve the request. Any questions, comments? Just clarification. I think 
Jim, you clarified for us, there's no food served in this uh, bar. Yeah, there's uh, the, uh, the the design of the uh, business itself. There's no plan to uh, sell food nor to prepare food on, on premises. I have a question about um, enforcement. So one of the, I think, shortcomings of our comprehensive smoking ordinance that we passed was we didn't really put a lot of teeth in the enforcement side of it, if you recall. Um, it was uh, citizen-led enforcement. Uh, our staff could step in any time that we asked them to, of course. And so I'm imagining um, a cigar bar and people walk outside. Do we have anything in this amendment that... Uh, either puts the impetus on the business owner or no there's okay. nothing in there it's basically just allowing it to occur within the facility okay does anyone else have that concern i mean you know when i'm downtown on the sidewalk i see a lot of people smoking still <laughs> if not that's okay well, that's always been a up. concern of mine from the original ordinance uh is is real lack of enforcement and, mm -hmm. and putting it on the business owner which is really not fair Probably to not them idea, and then yeah. the 15 foot uh limit to the doors is not always abided by mm -hmm. and uh so see a lot of violations of that yeah it sounds like we would need to have a larger conversation about enforcement mm -hmm. probably not specific to this mm -hmm. yeah seems prudent yeah yeah mm -hmm. any other questions comments no all right i'm gonna move on uh commissioner abraham <clears throat> I move that the Board of Commissioners introduce an ordinance entitled an ordinance amending ordinance number 2019-6-8578 entitled an ordinance adopting the City of Paducah, Kentucky annual operating budget for the fiscal year of July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020 by estimating revenues and resources and appropriating funds for the operation of city government. This ordinance is summarized as follows, that the annual budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2019 and ending June 30th, 2020, ordinance number 2019-6-8578 be amended by the following reappropriation transfer $72,000 from the FY20 unreserved general fund fund balance to the city block project account. Second. City manager. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. As uh, Commissioner Abraham attested to, this is basically moving uh, money, uh, making money available for us to spend this fiscal year that was uh, previously not in the budget. It was actually in our unaccounted for reserves. So basically, we're, this will allow us to actually to complete this project as part of the larger project being the uh, preliminary development agreement we entered into with Wayland Ventures several months ago. Uh, that agreement, of course, uh, had the city do four tasks. One was do a phase one of our environmental assessment. The second one was to do a uh, phase two environmental if necessary. That would be included in this uh, project, which we'll bring to the uh, Board of Commissioners at our next meeting. The third one would be for the geotechnical assessment of the city block downtown parking lot area, which we'll bring forward in an agreement with uh, HDR Engineering our next meeting as well. And then the fourth one would, would be to do a comprehensive parking assessment in the downtown area. So that arrangement has yet to be determined and we'll bring forth that agreement in the future. Do you have any questions, city manager? No? Okay. All right, we're going to move on and invite Katie Axe to come up and give a presentation on the city block pre-development agreement. Commissioners and Mayor, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Katie Axt. I am uh, the principal planner in the planning department, uh, the Main Street director, and the downtown development specialist. Um, I'm thrilled to come to you guys today to give you an update on our city block redevelopment project. 
As Jim just mentioned, I won't repeat what he just said, but back in April, uh, the commission signed an agreement, approved a pre-development agreement with a private developer, Wayland Ventures, out of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, to uh, do planning, design, and development of the municipal parking lot at 2nd and Broadway. Uh, this is a 12-month term um, that gives them exclusive rights to undertake a development program. There are certain obligations that the developer does and the certain and obligations that the city does that Jim kind of uh, summarized in terms of design and site plan and development program for the developer. And then the city takes on due diligence, including environmental review, geotech analysis, utility assessment, parking assessment. Also undertaking ongoing and extensive um, stakeholder engagement and continuing our efforts to move forward and get our TIF district approved. So where we are right now, is that the city has completed our phase one environmental review. And on August 30th, we received preliminary approval from the state for our TIF district. Um, we are undergoing and in progress for the other elements, um, including engaging the independent consultant for the TIF application, undertaking a, a phase two environmental review, geotech analysis. And in the future, in the near future, we will also be doing the parking assessment and the utility assessment. So we've completed two tasks and we have several more tasks that we need to do in the term of our pre-development agreement. The uh, Wayland Ventures has completed a site plan and then also conceptual design. So we wanted to present that, um, that to you also. And uh, we are undertaking um, both stakeholder and public engagement to start getting feedback on that. These are still preliminary. We want to um, hear people's comments and questions. Um, so that's why we're here today and also going out to different stakeholder groups to get that to get that feedback. Um, what is uh, in progress for Wayland Ventures is market analysis, feasibility analysis, and eventually finalizing their design and coming up with a final development program. So this site, um, as you are aware, is the municipal parking lot. It is city owned, uh, located uh, at 2nd and Broadway and bordered by Wa Water and Jefferson Street. And before we came up with any site plans, any conceptual renderings, um, our team working with Wayland Venture came up with about a handful of design and program goals. First and foremost being connectivity, to be able to design the space to visually and physically connect historic downtown, our existing arts and cultural destinations, and also Paducah's riverfront. Our riverfront is our most untapped asset and we are separated from it. So how do we facilitate development to connect us to our existing built environment and also the public assets that we have that we need to be able to use more of. The second program goal was to create a town square, to actually create a vibrant, multifunctional downtown destination that encourages people to gather, spend time, and support local businesses. The third one was actually to reestablish the historic rhythm of buildings on Broadway and Jefferson. I love these pictures because there used to be buildings on the municipal parking lot. The top picture is uh, the Richmond Lodging House and the bottom picture is actually if you were to stand at the flood wall at Water and Broadway and look up the 100 block and to see the existing buildings that are still there today and the ones that are no longer there. The fourth goal was actually to maintain off-street public parking. I know that this is a concern in some of the feedback that we have uh, received. Off-street public party parking is still part of this development program, and we're trying to design the parking lot to be flexible so that it can be used for public events, public markets, festivals, um, and other types of gathering in addition to providing parking need. And then lastly, uh, we want to continue to keep 2nd and Broadway kind of the energy and the heart of our downtown, where our gazebo is right now. Um, most of our activity when we do events, they're on the streets. How can we use that corner and continue to have it be the destination that it is today? So taking what is required to be included in the development program, the hotel, off-street parking, public open space, and mixed-use residential and retail, 
This is what Wayland Ventures has come up at, for a site plan. Along Jefferson Street is uh, the hotel. Along Broadway would be two mixed-use residential and retail buildings. In the middle is off-street public parking. And then along Water and along 2nd Street, we have two public open spaces. There would be a hardscaped public promenade that would actually connect uh, the intersection where the market house uh, is to the quilt museum, and then a softscape, a public park um, that would be along water that would really open up the ability for people to gather and enjoy the murals, um, which is a wonderful asset in downtown Paducah, and then also to connect through the flood walls at Broadway and at Jefferson. How this looks, if we were to uh, kind of look into the future, this is our existing view of the municipal parking lot. If you were to kind of stand on the roof of Shandy's uh, looking down, and this is our campus view that shows the hotel on Jefferson Street in the, in the background, the mixed use residential buildings in the foreground with the corner of Second and Broadway continuing to be used as public space with that promenade that connects to the Quilt Museum and off street public parking that's still available. If you were to stand at the Yeiser and look towards the gazebo parking lot, this is what we would see here with the mixed use residential retail um, buildings. And then if you were to stand at the flood wall of Water and Broadway, on the left hand side is, uh, is 100 Broadway, uh, the future barrel and bond being on the corner. And then again, a, a rendering of what we would see with the proposed development of being able to, again, reestablish what was there historically um, and to kind of complete the street and create more activity, more business opportunities, and more people living downtown, which is one of our goals. Again, a few some, some of the historic pictures uh, of the Richmond Lodging House and kind of the view from the corner. Uh, and then also um, the, the pictures of the flood. And in the 70s and 80s, what that municipal parking lot looked like when a lot of our historic buildings were under disrepair, dilapidated, and collapsing. And that's one of those challenges that we continue to face today, but that we're really starting to see that turnaround. We have been doing extensive stakeholder engagement, and that is on Going. So we've had several community meetings. We have more planned over there, October, November into December. Right now, again, we are just in the first stage. And as we reach certain milestones, I look forward to coming back to you as well as to the, uh, these other groups and to the public to keep everybody informed about where we are in this process. This project does not stand alone. It is critical for our TIF development. Um, this is a map of our, our TIF district. Um, this is what we presented to the state in August that's divided into three different districts, but it's all part of a whole. And this would be our first TIF development, uh, what, it, what we need in order to be able to get our 20 million local commitment that unlocks the local and the state taxes that we get to use to facilitate our infrastructure development. We've been doing over two decades of planning of this park, and we have a new plan. This is our build plan that was submitted for, uh, for this year. Um, but we don't have the financial resources to do that. TIF helps us, but we need private investment in order to be able to finance these projects. And so they're all connected together. <laughs> I did want to address um, some of the public feedback that we've been receiving, and I imagine we'll continue to get that. Um, one, I think, in the, uh, we've heard a lot about is about parking management, that there were concerns that we were going to be taking away all of the parking, um, and that uh, we would be creating new problems with parking. So one, as we've seen in these plans, there is still off-street parking that is part of this proposed development. And also, we are undertaking a parking assessment. That is some of our planned work that we'll be looking at capacity, as well as how do we manage our existing parking better? Because as you can see in this image, about half of our land use is given to parking, both public and private, off street and on street. This is, represents about 3,000 parking spots. And so 
Are there better ways to create information? Are, are there new technologies that get people to these parking spots in addition to continuing to provide parking in the heart of our downtown? Secondly, um, there has been feedback that this would take away barbecue on the river. And I understand, I understand that's a very um, important concern. Barbecue on the river is, is the best event that we have. It draws 40,000 people. Its mission, in addition to good barbecue, is to get people to downtown Paducah and into our shops. And so I wanted to just kind of talk that no, there's no plans to have barbecue on the river go away. Um, this picture is an image of how people experience barbecue on the river on the street and how it's crowded and it's energetic and there's a lot of activity. But when we step back, how is our parking lot used? A lot of the barbecue on the river activity happens on the street, but the municipal parking lot itself is underutilized. And so um, how this plan is currently proposed does not conflict with Barbecue on the River. It actually can continue to support it. And there's places to grow as Barbecue on the River grows. The third um, piece of feedback that I wanted to kind of focus on today with you was, um, uh, it was that there are still a lot of vacant historic buildings. And why do we not focus on filling historic buildings? Over the last four years, we've done over 87 projects to support historic downtown. The city, through its downtown development programs, has given a million dollars in grants. We have seen, year after year, several businesses opening up in downtown, and this has spurred millions of dollars, $5 million in the last four years alone, in private sector investment. And so from our perspective, more begets more. More activity, more development, more people, more commerce, that new development can actually support redevelopment in historic downtown. I also want to say that I do hear from several businesses that would like to open a business in downtown, but oftentimes the existing infrastructure, the existing, bus the existing buildings don't serve their needs. And so offering new, in addition to continuing to support our downtown development programs for historic buildings, they work together to be able to provide an opportunity for all businesses that want to come to downtown to find a home. So I want to just reemphasize come back because stakeholder engagement is so important. It's going to be through this entire process. At every milestone, we want to be talking to people. If you know of groups, if you know of citizens that are interested in providing feedback, please let us know. We want to set up those meetings. We are at this preliminary stage. It's a good time to engage. We have set up a web page on the city website that gives an update of where we are with this project. It provides context for why it's important, not only for growth for Paducah, but the larger context of TIF and redevelopment more broadly in downtown. And also it provides um, the, uh, a place to provide us comments. So people can email me at cityblock at Paducah KY. They can call me. Um, we, we want to hear from you. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, very much. Do we have any questions or um, comments for Katie? Katie, would you mention, uh, uh, and I brought this up because of the concern, mm -hmm. uh, and you talked about some numbers. The current city parking lot in that block uh, has spaces for, what, 215? Is that what you said? Spaces. Right. Would you kind of talk about how many the hotel expects to use? And, and they're planning on uh, using underneath the hotel for parking. Is that not correct or is that correct? Right. I will caveat this by saying, Commissioner, that this is very preliminary. So we do not have final parking numbers right now. But as the concept plan currently proposes, we have about 250 existing parking spaces on the municipal. 14. 214, sorry. Yeah, okay. It's not like you said 250. <laughs> um, uh, 50 of them will be as part of the hotel development for for guests that's within the within the structure itself and i believe that there's 150 of off street ground you know street level parking um, that would be within those two buildings 
So that's, that is what is currently proposed. But again, I want to stress this is preliminary mm -hmm. and still subject to change. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask you a question, um, and maybe this is also relevant for Jim. Uh, are there height restrictions for new buildings? There is not. Okay. There is not um, height restrictions currently in our zoning. Um, but one thing that, um, as Main Street Director, we have a design committee that is working on design guidelines. And part of that is coming up with guidance on, on massing <coughs> and size and heights and making sure that new infill development complements our existing historic structure. Part of the stakeholder engagement is to actually bring Wayland Ventures to come and meet with our design committee and have our experts all together around the table to provide input on the design of this proposal. Commissioner McElroy and I flew into DC and we were in the cab together and I, we remember us saying how beautiful the city was. Mm -hmm. And my first thought every time someone says it about DC is that they do have restrictions on how tall you can build buildings. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that would hurt us to have that conversation at a commission level. Sure. Um, I hear the guidelines definitely can inform that, but maybe have that conversation here at the commission level <coughs> as we get the TIF up and running and more development is, is of interest. Um, those things are probably more important now than ever. Absolutely. Thank you. I did want to add also that uh, Katie will be back at the next meeting as well, giving the same presentation yep. for, just to continue to spread the words. Yep. Address the view uh, in terms of the hotel and the building for people who maybe own condos or offices that are already there. Sure. So as you can see from this campus view, we, um, we designed this directly to address view sheds by having the buildings on the on the streets um, to um, so that the condo owners who currently live in uh, on Second Street can continue to have uh, their beautiful views of the murals and of the river. Um, also, the um, the building of the mixed use residential, as it is currently proposed, is shorter than the um, the office building um, that is across the street. So uh, those view sheds are also maintained. Um, so that was something that we began um, before having any of these designs because we knew that that was a concern of how do we make this work understanding that view sheds are really important thank you Commissioner. <clears throat> one of the things obviously is a concern if I'm a new business owner and and we all know how challenging that is to start a business and not only just own it but grow it mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with the recent completed construction of our new diamond double diamond, double diamond yes. out there by the mall and the uh, uh, just the headache that caused with some of the businesses out there mm -hmm. uh, with this with the new design uh, uh, I'm looking at that and my and I guess this question is for us also uh, that's that's a that's a pretty constricted area and if I own a business Along those, along that corridor, uh, with trucks coming in, backed up and uh, impeding my my uh, customer flow, uh, I think I think it would be we would be remiss if we didn't kind of take that into consideration and kind of plan on. Uh, I know sometimes you travel and a lot of work is done at night. I don't know how much uh, restrictions we can put on that, but uh, what we want to do, I would think would uh, keep in mind that there are business owners down there. And uh, I remember when we were talking about just changing the flow of traffic on Broadway, people were like, whoa, that's, that's, that would really uh, impact my business with a truck parked right there in, 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 in front of my building. So uh, I, I would think that would be a concern if I had a business downtown and major construction is going on at that, uh, at that parking lot. How that would uh, uh, how how that would stifle my my business. So I guess on this level, uh, we need to talk. You know, discuss uh, to keep that at a minimum because you, we don't want any business closing because mm -hmm. of uh, what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, mm -hmm. uh, so far it's a phased approach. 
So I'm assuming that might help mm-hmm. a little bit. That's my first thought. Well, but, just getting the particulars yeah. on that. But getting the particulars, yeah, I agree. Right. Part and negotiations. Yeah. Also, mm-hmm. um, Katie, I know Waylon is the developer. Would there be local then uh, contractors involved in, in actual construction and that kind of thing? We haven't gotten there in the in the discussions. Okay. That would be something, though, that we would be looking at. We can. Mm-hmm. And that, that, again, would come up during negotiations as well. Mm-hmm. So we can use that as a negotiation right. lever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have another question about um, the parking in general, and I think oftentimes this has really forced me actually to ask different questions than I typically have asked about parking. Yeah. Um, because as a 36 year old who exercises most every day, not every day, um, I mean, I don't really have an issue, right? I can walk, I can get there, I don't have a problem. We own a business downtown, we have a gym, and if you can't park and walk to the gym, mm-hmm. there's a problem there. Um, so it never really comes up. But mm-hmm. in this conversation with several people that I highly respect in our community, um, there is, it's brought to my awareness um, about the aging population population in Paducah and how that population helped grow Paducah and it matters that they get to access downtown as easy as possible. So to me, I haven't, I don't see very many parking, um, handicapped parking spaces downtown and it goes back to your parking management, not just parking quantity, but parking management. Can we talk a little bit about what that means and looks like for um, how we might make some progress on that? I often hear stories of, uh, particularly on Upper Broadway, where Mm -hmm. a customer has to circle four, five, six times Mm -hmm. to find a spot right in front of a retail shop. Well, that's unacceptable, right? Mm-hmm. Like it takes time, time is money. Also, it's it's a lack of access. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is what we are talking about when we talk about parking assessment. There's discussions around capacity, but there's also discussions around how do we manage and organize our existing parking better. So the example that you give about handicapped parking, we only have parking spots in our off street parking lots. There's not a single handicapped parking spot Mm -hmm. in all of downtown. So somebody who needs to be right next to the store circles five times because they can't find a spot that serves them. Loading, logistics, Mm -hmm. deliveries, I think that's also an important consideration. We have one loading zone, but we have several restaurants that don't have that mobility. That's also part of this. There's new technologies, new apps that help people find parking spots so that you're not spending that time and you can get as close as you can. I think there's also education and information about what is out there that um, the city needs to do a better job for. Um, We have a parking lot that uh, serves Upper Broadway that is actually closer than the municipal parking lot, but we don't have good signage. We don't have really good markings. There's no, not very good wayfinding. Those are all improvements that are part of a comprehensive strategy. It's not solving just one problem or the other, but a comprehensive strategy around how do we better manage and solve for parking challenges. Will this parking study look at all those things? Yes. And that was something that we articulated in our pre-development agreement with Wayland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner, do you have another question? Well, along that line, I was just thinking, you know, years ago, uh, you didn't have any residential, uh, 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 you didn't have residences along Broadway. Now, many of those businesses that are retail on the first floor, they have apartments or condos on the upper floors. And so those people have to have a place to park, and I'm sure some of them are parking on Broadway. So you, you know, you'll, a lot of those spots are occupied for hours, if not much of the day, because they're occupied by people who live upstairs or maybe employees who work in those businesses that don't think anything about it and just park. So maybe we need to address that in this assessment also as to how we... Enforcement is, is, uh, a, could be a part of that. Pricing can also be a part of that. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that we do pricing, but other communities who face challenges with, you know, available parking spots on the street, they use these solutions. And this is something that um, we as a community should have discussions around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. 
my residents or my tenants actually have um, asked before if there could be uh, permitted parking on Third Street, not on Broadway, but on the side streets, and that they'd be glad um, to be able to pay for that, so they could always have mm -hmm. a parking spot. Well, that's yeah. another that's another yeah. option for consideration. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Abraham brought that up. If you yeah. guys remember back, when we talked about our uh, budget discussions. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every now and then. Any other questions for Katie while she's up here? We'll see it again October 22nd, so we'll collect more questions okay. for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to comments from the city manager. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have to say that uh, kudos again to the HR staff, the team, and uh, uh, finance and the uh, all the employees really for uh, their active efforts in wellness and keeping those health insurance costs down that is unprecedented so that's a good kudos to the team uh, I've never seen anything like that that's that's wonderful mm -hmm. and the uh, second thing I have is just kudos to the state again too for the uh, 650,000 mm -hmm. we asked that we hoped for it our fingers were crossed and I was sitting here in shock <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic so glad to receive that so we'll put that money to good use that's all I have. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, comments from the commissioners? Anyone? I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that uh, my baby girl, McKinley, will be uh, performing in um, Once on This Island at the Carson Center. <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, Saturday night. And uh, I see folks around town, they're like, you must have, I mean, it's, it's got to be cool hanging out with Mick all day. Well, they go in a rehearsal at 12 o'clock, and they're not done until 11.45. So when I see her, it's like sleepy time. It's like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you because I have to because you're my father, but I'd rather be asleep. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, kudos to the Carson Center mm -hmm. for getting those equity shows and for tech rehearsal. That's, uh, that's a big deal. Really, it is. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Congratulations to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for your daughter's you. success. Yes, very You get a little credit for that. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I've got anyone it. else? Commissioner Watkins. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Commissioners. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about Barbecue River and and uh, uh, the dogs that I saw down there. Uh, I was there Thursday and Friday and Saturday all three days, mostly during lunchtime. Uh, hour and a half Thursday and Friday each, and probably about three and a half hours Saturday. How much barbecue did you eat? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Just can't tell. I have an active tapeworm, as I tell people. And, uh, I don't know where it goes. But uh, anyway, it's awfully good. Uh, Gluttony is my favorite sin. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I just said that to say that I, I wasn't there that long, but during the time that I was there, I spotted at least 20 dogs uh, while I was there. And, and, and in the past, we had passed an ordinance requiring dogs to be muzzled. Uh, in 2016, that was removed, and uh, the festival organizers were given the responsibility to enforce or decide what, if any, uh, regulations they were going to have concerning pets. <coughs> and so, you know, with those 20 plus dogs I saw just in the time that I was there, there were four German Shepherds, and one of them was probably 75, 80 pounds, and a, a young lady had it, and another German Shepherd was walking by from someone else, and they were, the bigger one was just ready to go after him, and she was mustering all her strength to try to keep the dog away. And he had a, she had a sign draped over this big German shepherd that said, hot dog, stay away, <laughs> something along that line. Uh, the dog was vicious. And, and, uh, and then I saw three pit bulls. I saw one mastiff. And then there was another one. I don't know what the breed was, but it was a good four feet tall and at least 80, 85 or more pounds, just guessing. But the point is you had some very large... A potentially aggressive dogs that were not muzzled downtown Paducah is 95 degrees and you had 40 uh, or more thousand people down there and, and it wouldn't take much you know we just had an incident in Paducah what, about a week ago where a three-year-old was mauled to death by his next-door neighbor Rottweilers and then uh, a couple of years ago in Ballard County, a kid was mauled to death by uh, neighbor pit bulls. 
And so it could happen very easily. And uh, I was talking, while I was down there, I was talking to Police Chief Laird, and he said we were talking about, you know, I know people love their pets and they love their dogs and they become like family, but, you know, festivals like Barbecue on the River are not the place to bring your dog to show off to everyone. <laughs> and Chief Laird told me, he said, one year I had a guy down here with a very long python draped over his shoulders at Barbecue on the River, if you could imagine. I couldn't imagine, but that was the case, so he had to run him off. So I just think that we need to do something uh, as a commission to talk about it more or uh, think about it at least uh, doing uh, passing an ordinance to either you know not allow pets at barbecue on the river and and, and the lower town arts and music fest these big festivals where you have a lot of people and a lot of young children um, either not having them or or have them muzzled uh, to me I don't, I don't know why does someone need to bring a big dog to barbecue on the river I don't understand it's not healthy and the chief also was talking about the health department and restaurant, uh, the ones uh, serving what they had to do when you had a dog come in and make themselves at home. So it, it's not healthy. It's very dangerous. Uh, and and uh, I think we're looking, uh, waiting for some serious problem to happen if we don't do something to address it. So anyway, that was my comments. Uh, Mayor, just to uh, piggyback on what Commissioner Watkins, we. If uh, Commissioner Wilson was here, she could uh, remember the conversation we had about that very subject a few years ago. And uh, I have two dogs. I'm a, I'm a dog lover. I would never bring my dog down to uh, uh, barbecue on the river. When I get home, they're like, "Where you been, Rich?" Yeah. You know, they're like. <laughs> um, but but here's what here's what happened at, at that meeting, and and things change, um, uh, feelings change about certain certain issues. But the, the muzzle idea came up. <laughs> we had a whole line of people at the mic talking about, well, what type of muzzle? Because certain muzzles won't allow the dog to breathe. And if they don't breathe, they're, you know, they're, they sweat through their, through their mouths. So can't you, you, you got to be, how, how are you going to know that? Um, so my suggestion at that point was get those folks that are experts on, on muzzles, and, and, uh, and that was the one we would use. Well, how would everybody know how to get that? So we, we went around that thing and, and, and basically, basically decided, well, um, we'll just won't do anything. Um, I don't think, uh, I think it, is a, it, it could be an issue with that many people so close together. Uh, with meat hanging off sticks and little kids about head high, you know, uh, folks walking and, you know, just not paying attention. Things could happen. But uh, I'm just saying the last time we, we, we talked about that, it was, a, it was a pretty big deal. So, I mean, we can talk about it again. I, I personally don't think that, you know, with that many people, uh, dogs should be uh, down there. That's that's my opinion. I keep mine at home, but uh, if we're going to talk about that, uh, we'll get a lot of different opinions on that. Just just laying that out there. Okay, just so we can end on a different subject, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to again put in a plug for the music garden that the Garden Clubs of Paducah a joint effort are working to put in at Noble Park. We're hoping to keep people in the park longer. Uh, we want our kids to have healthy. Uh, stimulating things to do so we've got a wonderful the boundless playground is wonderful I'm getting reacquainted with all of these things since I now have a grandchild in Paducah but uh, it's going to be situated so that you could be on the playground walk around the lake get a little exercise and then stop on the other side of our beautiful noble park for the music garden and I'm not talking about bang oh my gosh cover my ears kind of instruments I'm talking about high quality beautiful instruments that you will love sitting on a couple of benches and and listening to kids striking them, I think you're going to even be tempted to want to get out there and play something yourself. Uh, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be fun. Probably about 12 kids at a time can actually be doing things on these instruments. Uh, we've got a rep coming to town. Mark Thompson's working with him, getting him in town in uh, probably the week after next to kind of lay this all out for us. And the last thing I'm going to say is if you want to help do this in honor of your children or maybe your grandchildren, call me. <laughs>
Thank you, Commissioner. All right, we have uh, Randy Beeler here to speak about the smoking ordinance. Full house, Mayor. You're passing? Okay, all right, great. Well, with that, I think it's time to adjourn. Is no, that true? I'm out. No. I'm on there. I filled one out. I filled one out. Where did they go? Oh, they just got here. I don't know where to put it. There's a box right here. Sorry, I should have made that obvious earlier. Sorry about that. Can we, Commissioner Abraham, would you grab those for yeah, them? Thank you so much. You can give it. You can give it to me. I know they must have gotten. They must have gotten stuck over there. That one was in the box. Yeah. Randy Beeler is an expert at public comment, so he knows where everything is. <laughs> While they're trying to figure that out, mate, did y'all y'all want to address that? If you're going to speak, you have to come up. If you're going to speak about the smoking ordinance, yes. Is it about the smoking ordinance? Yes. Okay. Yes, y'all want to Abraham. address the teeth part. Thank you. The what? People smoking downtown, putting teeth in the oh. ordinance. That will be. You're planning on doing that? I mean, if I understood that correctly, that's why option. I wasn't going to talk. So y'all going to do this later date? If we have the conversation, it will be. That's all I need. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Mr. Ward, would you like to go first? See, I'll go first. Oh, okay, good. Well, I, was, I think that hotel idea was pretty good. I thought it was going to be like a big high rise blocking everything. But the way it's laid out, where they're that way and that way, you're not going to be blocking the existing condos down there. So I was really, I, I, I was worried about that, and I, I like that idea that it's not blocking. All those people have invested money to live down there. But then, hey, guys, can we please give him the respect he deserves, please? He's at the podium. Okay. Then as far as the parking goes, uh, if you're talking about 215 down there now, 214, it shouldn't be, it looks like, with all the vacant lots around to come up to, with that shortfall. I mean, I know a lot of people complain about walking. I don't. When it doesn't... When I went to the barbecue festival, I walked six blocks, which leads me to another point. I've been within the last year to like a festival at Owensboro or Hopkinsville, which had big crowds too. But they have, they ran their city buses on a regular route for people to get to the heart of the festival. I realize y'all had down there at Noble Park. But a lot of people didn't know about parking at Mobile Park and coming downtown. So really, to me, it looks like the only time you have problems downtown is maybe on weekends are these big festivals. In those cases, I would just maybe use the city buses and make the public aware to where there wouldn't be a parking problem if they had to park a long way away as they walk. And then another thing comes up. I know some people that were handicapped who didn't come to the barbecue festival because they didn't like a walk a long ways. And then they, there, was no, there was no, next year for the barbecue festival, it looks to me like y'all should have a designated handicapped area and publicize it. Since you mentioned handicapped tonight, where people would know about it and they could park there and then maybe take public transportation down to the riverfront. <coughs> So that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you. All right. Next up, uh, Alberta Davis. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I've been a realtor in Paducah for 15 years. Alberta, could you get in front of the microphone? No yes, sir. You <laughs> Pull it down. Down. Just it I've been a realtor in Paducah for 15 years. I've been, me and my husband, been buying, selling, and developing real estate in Paducah for 38 years in Midtown and Downtown. And I think that you all should ask realtors and investors when you do a project like the hotel downtown because I think we probably know a little bit. And uh, when I show a building downtown, I tell them all the, all the things that we need downtown. We need apartments, we need retail, we need all this stuff. But with this new development, what am I gonna tell people when I show them? 
a building downtown if you're going to do the development. So that kind of leads to I don't know what I'm going to say because we won't need anything after that. So you'll just have empty buildings. And I work really well with Katie Axe. She calls me all the time to open buildings, bring her a key, bring her some paperwork. So where's that at now? I don't want to work in the city anymore or downtown Paducah because I don't have anything to tell my clients that's great about Paducah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Randall Knight? Yes. Hi. Come on up to the podium, please. Uh, yeah, I did want to make some comments and even ask some questions about the new downtown development. Uh, it looks like actually at this meeting, $150,000, if if we're counting on doing a TIF district and if that's going to help pay for this, between that and a geotech survey, it looks like we just approved $150,000 for this project. Just what I'm reading. I don't know if that's correct or not, but directly or indirectly, it looks like we just spent $150,000 of my money because I do live here. I do own property. I pay as much taxes as anybody in this room. Well, that's not true. That's not true. Some of these guys got a lot of property. Um, we have a business downtown. And I mean, we're on Jefferson, so nobody ever talks about us or does anything on Jefferson. Nonetheless, I do have a dog in this hunt because that property is a core asset that even though in my case, because I'm on Jefferson, it's a peripheral asset, it is still something that I count on. And I'm looking at a picture where half the square footage of that block is gone. And I've got somebody telling me they're gonna expand, put in park areas, expand the gazebo family area <clears throat> excuse me and they're going to put in a hotel and a whole row of retail buildings and that it's not going to take away any parking i don't believe in unicorn y'all i mean you're adding requirements for parking adding requirements taking away square footage and you're telling me that we're not going to be missing any parking spots and i don't really see how that's physically possible it didn't even look like that in the photo talking about doing a, a geo survey for underground parking our business floods about every year every other year the ground floor floods well, if my ground floor floods because of poor drainage, well, their parking lot's going to be a swamp. I know for a fact that the building across the street from where you're building, their basement floods every time there's a bad rain. So I, I, I'm not buying off on a lot of this, and y'all are spending money right now, and you're just now getting public comments kind of putting the cart in front of the horse a little bit. Uh, we've got a lot of issues. Uh, the Kresge site, great site, parking lot. Thank you, Mr. Knight. I'm going to have to shut you off there. Thank All you right. so much. I just want to make one correction. There is not a proposal for underground parking, just so you know. That's not a proposal. We can talk about it afterwards if you want to. Um, it, it, it must have been a misunderstanding or we heard it wrong, but there's not a proposal for underground parking. Um, okay, next up, Melinda Winchester. Okay, so before you start my clock, can we have Katie pull up one of the renderings she had in her presentation? She's, Katie, you're still here. Can we pull that up of the downtown parking lot? Do you have access to it? I have access to it, yeah. yeah. Do you know which one? Um, well, there were two that I was interested in. One. The first one that kind of showed the, bu the buildings there. I guess my question is, is that to scale? 
with our parking lot? And what are the sizes of each of those buildings that I'm seeing in this? None picture? of those details have been figured out yet. So okay, that's a preliminary conversation that we can't have yet. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 well, no. And then go back to the park. The I'm going to have to push your timer. I'm sorry. I have to be fair, Melinda, to everyone. That's okay. I'm sorry. That's we okay. can talk about this afterwards if you want to. But. I would love to do okay. that. So anyways, okay. I'm here tonight as a new citizen of Paducah, which mm -hmm. I'm really excited about. I'm official here. Um, but also as my role as the past Main Street Director and Downtown Development Special. So specialist so please take all of my comments tonight as constructive recommendations based on that um, here's my question so just get ready can our number support another hotel the market study that you all had done showed year after year decline on hotel occupancy since 2015 also average occupancy is at 58.2 percent in 2017 what is the best practice benchmark for adding our hotel capacity? I'd like to know that. Um, this location that's been selected was identified to serve our arts and cultural tourism. The information provided in this market, this hotel analysis that was provided for that hotel demand for those types of venues is all from 2015. I cannot find anything else in that hotel market analysis for anything after 2015. So those are numbers that I think we need to look at and we need to get so we can actually see where are we at with those types of venues for hotel demand from 2016 to 2019. What share of these tourism dollars is the development firm counting on to make this work with their investors? And what is the strategy to fill these new commercial storefronts with businesses? Who is responsible for this as well? Is that the developer? That's another question. Your TIF hotel market study, again, under findings and recommendations, indicated that a new hotel targeted to capture this arts and culture demographic should be 35 to 50 rooms, a boutique hotel. What I'm seeing on that parking lot is a lot bigger than 35 to 50 rooms. So, But that's the recommendation in the hotel market study. Um, the Kresge lot, to me, seems to be more conducive to this type of boutique hotel development with the commercial component. I know you need that block and all that commercial um, development for the TIF application, but if we could relook at spreading out some of that development in different areas and still get that same $20 million, that might be a better avenue to go. Um, Existing businesses, I could talk all day about that, and historic structures, I have 27 seconds. Our downtown is changing so much. More people are coming down there, which is great because I struggled with that, getting our local people to come down as Main Street Director. Um, they come down in the evenings at lunch on the weekends. Um, our parking, what can we accommodate? This is what we need to look at when you guys do that parking assessment. Um, parking for the new hotel, new retail, new residential in this development, and the new workforce. Where are they going to park? Okay. Thank I you. I guess very I'm much. done. Thank you. All right, Rebecca Osbrooks. <laughs> no, sorry, ma'am. Hi, I'm Rebecca Osbrooks, and thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I want to second most of what Melinda said because I feel like there were some other areas that could be better used. We, All the comments I have ever heard from anybody in Paducah is they don't want the hotel down there. They want it in a different spot. And if we are losing more parking spots, but we're going to be recreating creating more residential homes, more businesses, then we're still gonna need even more parking. So that's sort of a conundrum there. And then also, what are the plans for our main commercial corridor from 9th Street to 2nd Street? In the City Comprehensive Strategic Plan Objective E1, page five, it states to encourage and assist local business retention and expansion. Okay, that's from Melinda, you can answer that one. 
and uh, I'm glad you all have the website because I'm going to try to get that out and let more of the city come in. And we are, I'm still helping with the petition, you know, because I feel sort of like what Randy said, the cart got before the horse. The people are now finding out about this, but we've already entered into a contract and just spent $150,000. So, okay, I'm done early. Thank you very much. All right, Marshall Davis. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for having us here to let us talk. I'm a lifelong resident of Paducah, and I also am uh, newly aware of this project, and I just have a few questions or comments. I would appreciate a response, and I assume a response wouldn't be uh, forwarded tonight, but I'll try to get you this memo in an uh, appropriate manner, and maybe you all can correspond with us then. But is it possible for the par parking lot to receive TIF funds for repair and development and remain an asset? of the city. Has anyone in the city engaged in discussing with the Holiday Inn to understand why they have not yet exercised their option to build on the former nursing home site? Can you outline the current redevelopment and growth activities downtown that you expect will increase the demand for additional hotel rooms in the downtown area? And uh, why were alternative sites outlined in the TIF district hotel market study not considered and listed in the great agreement. Two of the sites <laughs> identified in the market, bless you. Thank you. Two of the sites identified by the market study for the TIF districts are next to the current hotel Holiday Inn, which is adjacent to the Expo Center. Why not utilize one of these for the project? Uh, the de development ties up the property for a minimum of 12 months and states the city cannot give anyone else incentives for a project in area during that time. It appears if the city wants to develop this central business district of downtown, one would look for such projects to serve as an anchor further into the district, not choke off and situate everything in the riverfront. The Carson Center is there as well as other drivers for this parking lot location, but many museums and art culture venues are seasonal and depend on this area for their patrons' parking. Where are those 220 parking places calculated as part of the formula to meet the parking requirements for the Carson Center? This center, this development, as I understand, would only have approximately 150 parking places, which would be slated for, or some of those would be slated for their customers. What would be the parking arrangement utilized to fill the Carson Center's need, plus those of other surrounding businesses? The other locations identified in the TIF market study for hotel misuse development seem to not only meet the requirements, but to help develop properties in close proximity to vacant buildings. Why not develop those first? Uh, some of those locations are also owned by the city. Last, I'm sure there's several local locals interested in some sort of mixed use development especially on this location if it can be required for a minimum of $325 and the city will do environmentals, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Thank Davis. You. Please get that to us. Absolutely. Those are great All questions. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for your comments. Uh, as Katie tried to iterate, this is we are in the preliminary stages. I heard a few references to the cart got before the horse, and uh, please know this has been a conversation um, that is still very preliminary. This feedback matters a whole lot to us. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>